nothing to practice either or both, but we are the true Marxist-Leninists, for we believe that the quick, violent approach is more effective in today's modern world. And there's the total difference between the two factions of world communism. Each claims to be more correct in its interpretation of classical communist strategy. But as far as the United States is concerned, you can be sure that it makes precious little difference. Both types of revolution are being used against us today. Both are enhanced by the presence of the other, and both lead to exactly the same destination. All right, let's move along now to the second conclusion. The strategy for violent revolution in America calls for chaos, anarchy, destruction, a crisis in government, mass confusion and panic among the people, and then out of the vacuum, the sudden seizure of power by communist-led guerrilla bands. Now this is the kind of activity, the overthrow of government by force and violence, that most people think of when they speak about communist revolutions, so there's no need to belabor the point. But I'm going to take just a moment to show the extent to which the communists actually are planning to use this kind of revolution against the United States. Now this is not so well known. Now, here is a book that I think ought to be in every home library. It's entitled, Color, Communism, and Common Sense by Manning Johnson. Now, as you can see from his photograph, Manning Johnson was a Negro, and he was also a member of the Communist Party. He joined the party as a young man because he honestly believed that the communists were trying to improve the conditions of his people. He was a dedicated communist and eventually he rose to one of the highest ranks. He was appointed to the National Negro Commission of the Communist Party USA. But after many years, Manning Johnson finally came to the realization that the communists weren't the least bit interested in improving the conditions of the Negro people. He discovered that instead they were merely planning to use his people, and these are his words, to use them as cannon fodder in a bloody revolution to destroy America. And when he woke up to this, he dropped out of the party and devoted the rest of his life trying to alert his fellow citizens of all races to the true nature of the Communist Party as he knew it to be from the inside. And this book contains much of that story. I wish I had the time to examine the entire volume with you page by page, but here at least is one short quotation that pertains to the immediate topic. Manning Johnson said, Black rebellion was what Moscow wanted. Bloody racial conflict would split America. During the confusion, demoralization and panic would set in. Then finally the Reds say, now at this point he quotes verbatim from a communist directive that he studied while inside the party. Workers stop work. Many of them seize arms by attacking arsenals. Street fights become frequent. Under the leadership of the communist party, the workers organize revolutionary committees to be in command of the uprising. Armed workers seize the principal government offices, invade the residences of the president and his cabinet members, arrest them, declare the old regime abolished, establish their own power. Now, here is a piece of vicious communist propaganda that perhaps some of you have seen. It's called The Crusader. It's published periodically in Red China and is widely circulated through the Negro communities here in America. It's written by Robert F. Williams, one of the organizers of the Revolutionary Action Movement, better known as RAM. Williams also was the president of the local chapter of the NAACP in Monroe, North Carolina. At that time, needless to say, he wasn't telling very many people that he was also a member of the Communist Party. Now one day back in 1961, he decided to start a small war of national liberation of his own. Apparently he was too impatient to wait for the big signal. So finally to avoid prosecution for assault with a deadly weapon and for kidnapping, he fled to Cuba and then to Red China, where he now writes communist propaganda. One other thing you should know about Robert Williams is that recently he was elected by members of SNCC, CORE, RAM, the NAACP, and similar groups as the president in exile of something called the Republic of New Africa. Following the communist line in every detail, these men claim that they're the representatives of a new government and a new nation within the continental borders of the United States. They issued a demand to the State Department 
that a large segment of land be turned over to them as their rightful territory. The proclamation said that they're now prepared to negotiate in good faith the peaceful transfer to them of the southern portion of the United States. The implication being, of course, that if they don't get it peacefully, then they'll just have to take it by force and violence. Already, the Republic of New Africa has established a central headquarters in Mississippi, and its leaders in the north are actively recruiting a Black Panther guerrilla force and what they call a Revolutionary Freedom Corps, the RFC, from among black militant students to act as organizers and to set up local provisional governments, as they call them, in the so-called ghetto areas. But the reason I've mentioned all this is merely to introduce properly one Robert F. Williams, the president in exile of this Republic of New Africa and the author of The Crusader. Now here is what Robert Williams says. The lifeblood of U.S. capitalism is its productive capacity and its extensive commerce. If these two factors were to become paralyzed and rendered sterile, the orderly function of the government establishment would degenerate into a state of chaos and the superstructure of the system would collapse. The more automated a society is, the more vulnerable it is to forces of calamity. What would highly mechanized America be without electrical power? What would it be without modern transportation? What would it be without its industrial capacity? And then having asked these questions, Robert Williams proceeds to explain in minute detail exactly how to manufacture the devices that can be used by a mere handful of people to ensure that highly automated America will lose its electrical power, its modern transportation, and its industrial capacity. I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that less than a dozen people, if they know what they're doing, can reduce any of our major cities into a helpless, seething mass of confusion, panic, and death. Just one person, one person can poison the city's entire water supply or destroy the main aqueduct or blow up the principal pumping stations. And where would people in Los Angeles, for instance, get a drink of water if it didn't come out of a pipe? And how long can a human being survive without water? Four or five days, perhaps? But long before that, there'd be tens of thousands of people dead in our cities, not from thirst, but because they were unable to defend what water they had from roving bands of desperate people who were dying of thirst. And that's thinking only of the loss of water. In your mind's eye, compound that with no food, no electricity, no way to dispose of sewage, no police protection, no water pressure to fight fires, no radio or TV, no telephone, no buses, no gasoline for your car, no way to escape, no place to go if you could. And don't think for a minute that the countryside would be immune from disaster either. In this issue of the Crusader, the communists call not only for extensive chaos within the cities, but for putting to the torch every village, every forest, every field, and every barn. The plan is for raging fires from one city to the next. The reason? Well, first, there's the value of sheer destruction. Secondly, it would force us to deploy our defenses and rescue units over the widest possible area. The communists point out that as long as our police and National Guard remain concentrated, they're invincible. But if they can be forced to spread out over the entire city and into the countryside as well, then they can be picked off from ambush one by one. And the third value of massive fire to the communists is psychological. The average American, they say, soft and decadent, when he sees billows of black smoke rising from one horizon to the other, when at night the only light he has to see by is the flickering red from flames leaping into the sky, he'll become paralyzed with fear and panic. He'll run away and hide and do nothing to interfere with the guerrilla bands as they strike at the community's power centers. The Crusader explains how to set up sniper units in crowded metropolitan areas, how to manufacture jumbo Molotov cocktails, the gallon jug size, and how to mix the gasoline with certain ingredients to make it burn like napalm, how to pour gasoline into utility manholes in the streets to set fire to the main telephone cables, how to put sulfur tips from matches into air conditioning units and blow up large buildings, how to ignite gas mains and oil storage tanks, it explains how 
radio-controlled model airplanes can be used to fly explosive